Okay, hi everyone. Today we have um, Dr. Jean-Claude Vey here, who's an ob physician who's been practicing for 35 years. And I just wanted to um, first thank him for joining me in this interview today. And um, uh, thank you so much again for being part of this interview. You're welcome. Okay, so Dr. Vey, could you just kind of describe what um, being an ob physician kind of entails in like a short form and we'll kind of get into it more a little bit more in depth later on? Sure. Being an OB-GYN has two components, as the name says, OB and GYN. So OB is the obstetrical pendant, which is really the delivery, taking care of the pregnant patient, and the gynae is really sort of the non-pregnant part of the woman's condition. And um, so with that brief overview, I just kind of want to step back and talk about what made you get into medicine first, and then also what made you specifically kind of want to get into uh, ob gyn well, medicine was always something that I thought I could do, uh, I wanted to do, and then I came across a person that really influenced my whole life. His name was Dr. Heimovich, and he was a fantastic uh, family practitioner who was passionate about his job, and through his passion, uh, there was no question that this is what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. Mm -hmm. So his, his passion kind of kind of transferred over to you. Absolutely. Did you like the kind of like the material more than other other fields, or was it more just his passion that kind of drew you to that, and then you drew an affinity to that? Well, through him, I learned what actually being a physician was all about. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only the science, not only the practice of medicine but also um, the role that he played for his patient beyond medicine was something that impressed me. They trusted him, they relied upon him, they thought the world of him. And just to see that his waiting room was full of patients um, who was waiting, they all were waiting for him to help them. Uh, that was the passion. And the way he was, um, his compassion, the way he felt about the interaction between him and his physician, his bedside manners stayed with me the rest of my life. I fell in love with that. I fell in love with his style. And in my mind, this was really the profession that I wanted to embrace. Before this, I wanted to be an architect, mm. and because uh, I love buildings and I love passion, but did not like uh, calculus. So mm. I think that yeah that did it. But nowadays they have programs that do it for you, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Could you just kind of walk through like a typical day of your life as an OB guy physician? Right. So usually uh, there is two components, or at least three components. One is an outpatient, in other words, when you see patients in your office. Mm -hmm. Two is an inpatient, when you see either patients that have, are going to uh, go into labor, or if you have some surgery, that could be a third component. So it's really uh, a mixture of both medicine, obstetrics, and surgery. This is why I love OBGYN. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like everything instead of just like focusing on primary care and not having any surgery or doing surgery and not having any kind of like longer term patient interaction? That is correct. Plus you have the added bonus of being part of a woman's life mm -hmm. that she will always remember. That is the delivery of the children. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a lasting impact. It is. Okay. And how does the lifestyle of an ob gyn physician differ, differ from some other specialties? like a surgery or family practice or things like that. Right, so again, the OB component is a bit more challenging mm -hmm. as most babies do not have a clock mm -hmm. and they do not observe office hours. Mm -hmm. uh, they come whenever they want and they do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's a bit of, a, of a, an adjustment. It's not an, an, an eight to five or nine to five job. Mm -hmm. It's a 24-hour job, uh, but sometimes you get up and it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you go and deliver a baby and you see the joy, the passion of not only your patient, her partner, her family, and you forget that it is 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. 
So in like like practical terms, is that uh, how's your work kind of work hours? Is that are you on call the whole day for like most days of the week, or how does that work out? Right. It could be scary, but in the old days, you could have private practitioners, in other words, solo uh, OBGYN, and there's not a whole lot of them mm -hmm. in existence. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it is a pool. Uh, usually, you belong to a group. The group could vary from maybe three, four people. So therefore, you don't call one in three, one in four. If it's a bigger group, it's one in six. Mm -hmm. And then usually groups, for example, in a city like Sacramento, could really associate themselves for the weekend. Mm -hmm. So a group of five may merge with a group of six, may merge with another group, and therefore, at the end of the day, you probably on call one weekend out of eight. Mm -hmm. uh, so that makes it manageable. Okay, so in ob we just say everyone's pretty much part of a group, and that's how they kind of do it. They rotate uh, being on call on different weekends? Most of the time, yes. What kind of like practice um, settings and employment types are there besides, uh, you, you mentioned that group is the most prominent. Is there still opportunity for a private practice or is there um, opportunity to do a lot of like academic work, for example, or research as well? Okay, you're bringing another good point. You could really choose the academic route mm -hmm. and being in a department of OBGYN at any major university. Mm -hmm and therefore you have a title and then you have a responsibility of teaching residents mm -hmm. and medical students, that's one route. Mm -hmm. Or you could be in private practice, mm -hmm. solo, or in a group. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you may or may not have a few medical students, you may or may not teach residents, but you don't have the obligation of the university. Mm -hmm. And usually, as I said, in a university setup, uh, you may have the same ID, which is a group, of five or six, yeah. or in a private setup, you may be solo or in a group. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, so you say there's still opportunity for, some people want to be like more entrepreneurial and kind of start their own business, there's still opportunity for that in ob -Gan? Oh, absolutely, at every level there's mm -hmm. opportunity to improve things and mm -hmm. to, to come up with better techniques mm -hmm. and, and market things. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like, uh, I know talking to some surgeons, for example, some of them have said that everything's kind of shifting towards like hospitals and like bigger groups and things like that. And so there's kind of like, I guess less opportunity or less, um, less prevalence, a lot of prevalence of like private practice physicians, but you haven't really seen that in ob or? No, I actually, you know, a, a lot of physicians have most of their days, when you mm -hmm. ask me what is my typical day, spent in the office. Mm -hmm. For example, they may do rounds Mm -hmm. on gynae patient that they have performed some surgery mm -hmm. or OB patient where they have done a delivery or cesarean section in the morning. Mm -hmm. So depending on the load, maybe you have three, four, five patients in the hospital, mm -hmm. you do your rounds and then you go into your office. Mm -hmm. And most of the time there is a person who covers labor and delivery while you're in the office. Mm -hmm. This way you don't swing back and forth mm -hmm. and you know risk the fact that some of those patients may waiting for you to deliver a patient. Mm -hmm. So the structure is usually you assign to your patient, you go and do your rounds, then you go into the office, and you do your office until five or six, mm -hmm. and if you're on call, then you take the hospital call, mm -hmm. um, and if you're not on call, then you go home, yeah. or whatever you want to do. Okay. So are there any misconceptions about your specialty that maybe you could talk about a little bit? Yes, and fortunately, uh, there has been sort of a, a swing of the pendulum. Mm -hmm. When I started, 95% of the OBGYN were men, mm -hmm. with a few, very few women. Mm -hmm. The pendulum has swung the other way, mm -hmm. where now it's about 90, 80, 90% 90 of women mm -hmm. and only a few men. And um, that has scared a lot of medical students mm -hmm. uh, of, of thinking of even being an OBGYN. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there will always be patients who may not want to be examined by a man mm -hmm. for religious reason, for yeah. example, and that you're not going to change. Yeah. Uh, some may not object. Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, it is the type of physician that you are as opposed mm -hmm. to male, female. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I heard even from some of my friends who are third years that uh, sometimes they have to sit out a lot and they don't get to like participate or they kind of feel like left out. And unfortunately, sorry, the audio cut off, but um, Dr. Bay was talking about how it used to be a predominant
predominantly um, kind of like a male dominated field. And then it turned into, it shifted to more of a female dominated field. And um, I was bringing up how uh, even like my med student friends who are, who've done the third year uh, rotations have talked about how there's uh, a lot of um, times where they have to sit out and they kind of miss out on the opportunities that they kind of wanted to see with ob um, uh patients and uh, how do you kind of think we should kind of work around that. And I think really that should not be a deterrent to choosing ob as a specialty. Mm -hmm. I think there will always be women that do not want to be examined by male. Just the same thing as urology, there will always be men that do not want to be examined by a female urologist. Mm -hmm. you know. So that's not going to change. However, I think this, this is a minority mm -hmm. and there are certain groups in town, for example, if we use our own city of Sacramento, that really are only women. Mm -hmm. And the population really knows that this is a female only group and they'll go to them. Mm -hmm. But the majority of others, you know, it really, I don't think it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's still opportunity for men to get into ob -GYN. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, what are the most challenging aspects of being an ob physician? I think it's juggling time mm -hmm. and being efficient and trying to, uh, just because you know, the OB component is, has a lot of variation, variability in terms of when the baby delivers. So this is the constant that you cannot control. And this is why as physicians mature in their practice after 20, 30 years, they probably give up doing the OB and they become more and solely gynecologist. Mm -hmm. And the gynecologist will only do outpatient and inpatient surgery, but it's much more controlled. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of—is that part of like the general progression of like every like medicine in general to like specialize kind of? Or I don't know if it is the trend, but at least in our field in OB/GYN, mm -hmm. this has been you know when you're young and you have yeah. a lot of energy mm -hmm. and you don't mind sleeping two or three hours, mm -hmm. um, y you know you are able to keep up. And as you get older, uh, I think this, this becomes a bit more taxing mm -hmm. and some physicians decide slowly and surely to give up the OB component mm -hmm. and to stick to dying. I heard that happens with, uh, with emergency too, where like in the beginning people are kind of have that energy and then after they start going to like administration and things like that. Yes, there's a component of a burnout, mm -hmm. there's no question. And OBGYN, especially the OB, we have two patients. We have mm -hmm. the mother and we also have the fetus. Mm -hmm. And we would like to have a success, you know, successful outcome every mm -hmm. time, but it, it, it is a bit more taxing mm -hmm. when something happens to either one or both. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, after 30 years of practice, mm -hmm. you're bound to have a difficult case. Yeah. And that really takes its toll. Is it more like, like congenital illnesses or is it like actual like death or? It could be both. We have, especially what I do is um, oh, it's a subspecialty of OBGYN, which is mm -hmm. called maternal fetal medicine. Mm -hmm. This is the medical aspect of OBGYN, which is a fellowship. Usually after your four years of OBGYN, you do another three years of subspecialties. Mm -hmm. And we have three subspecialties one is in maternal fetal medicine, two is in oncology, and three is in infertility. Mm -hmm. And now there's a rising pelvic fellowship. So you could subspecialize. Mm -hmm. So in my particular case, I do take uh, patients that are usually have some significant disorders, mm -hmm. and therefore the risk of something happening to either the patient mm -hmm. or her fetus is higher. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the mother may be sick and that may affect the baby mm -hmm. if she has a congenital heart disease, for example. Or the fetus may have a congenital anomaly, which then may affect the mother. So, mm -hmm. yes, indeed. How do you kind of deal with that um, as an OB-GYN physician and kind of mitigate those like more sensitive issues and avoid burnout? Well, I can give you, you know, a quick fix. Each patient is... is um, is different. Each patient 
carries their own emotional package. Um, but, for example, the way I personally deal with it is that sometimes I get a Christmas card or I get a card from mm -hmm. uh, a patient who sort of say, wow, you know, here's the picture of the child that you delivered who had a significant problem. For example, uh, in the old days, I used to transfuse, I, I transfused this baby five or six times in utero, mm -hmm. and she still sends me a card saying, hey, I'm 12, 14. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I, I cope with it, by mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. yes, uh, I made a bit of a difference to someone's life, mm -hmm. and I think that's key. So it's a small, the small reminders of like the impact you've had in improving people's lives. That kind to of me, yes, that's mm -hmm. important. You talked a little bit about the kind of like the challenging aspects. What are the most rewarding aspects? You you mentioned before. I think the long term care and having an impact in people's lives. Is, is there anything else, or is that kind of like the most important, most rewarding aspect? Seeing the difference or the impact you can make. Well, I think that's that's the prime thing. Just to sort of um, take a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's the journey. That's a contract that I establish with the patient. And to me, I judge a successful outcome mm -hmm. for the patient and for her, her fetus or her newborn as that challenge. Mm -hmm. And that keeps me going. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's that's what makes my specialty uh, to me so fascinating. So for someone interested in getting to Obiga, and you mentioned also the subspecialties, there's like three or four, or fourth is kind of coming up. Um, how would you recommend they position, position themselves, maybe as an undergrad or uh, especially as a medical student, to get into an ob specialty? If I could really share my own personal journey, I didn't think originally that I was going to be an ob mm -hmm. uh, I told you Dr. Hagovich was, was my mentor, and he was a family practitioner, and he was a fantastic one. Mm -hmm. So I thought, wow, maybe internal medicine is for me. And then I, I personally felt that my, my personality mm -hmm. did not quite match. Mm -hmm. um, then I, I, I thought maybe surgery was something that I really liked. And then even though I liked to be in the OR, I, I didn't feel that there was a continuity of care. I mean, uh, yes, they had a gallbladder, I removed it, and. Mm -hmm. Then they went away, and that was it. Yeah, I, I had some satisfaction, but not quite. Then I thought, okay, ED is what I want, emergency medicine, because it's fast-paced, and mm -hmm. you know, you got to know the disease, the first five minutes of each disease. But where I really kind of did not enjoy the whole spectrum of it is that I never had a follow-up. Mm -hmm. I never knew was that right, wrong, what happened to the patient? So I used yeah. to grab somebody in the hallway and say, hey, Mrs. Smith, what happened to her? And, yeah. and so on and so forth. So I kind of felt like I was missing mm -hmm. the whole aspect. And then I happened to be doing OB, GYN, and I thought, oh my, it has the surgery. Oh my, it has the internal medicine. Oh my, it's got the baby catching. Oh my, it's got this, and it's got the oncology. It's got all those facets. The only thing that I had to give up is taking care of male. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you do OBGYN, you're never going to take care of another <laughs> man. But I, I, I was okay with that. So, uh, are there any specifics that you recommend for someone trying to get into OBGYN? So, thank you for reminding me of your original question. So, what I was trying to say is don't box yourself in. Mm -hmm. Keep an open mind. Try to do every single specialty mm -hmm. and see what you like, number one. Number two, if you happen to really like OBGYN, mm -hmm. sincerely, and if you don't mind getting up.
So then I would say, if this is the field that you want, then I would say, try to choose the place where you want to live, mm -hmm. try to find a university hospital if you can, mm -hmm. and then decide, let me do an AI, let me do Salai, let me mm -hmm. try to find, so that people get to know me. Mm -hmm. uh, so that when the application comes in with the 10, 12, 20 others, and mm -hmm. there's only two or three spots, they'll remember me. Mm -hmm. uh, try to make a good impression, try to sort of uh, be attentive to detail, try to be part of the team, try to communicate with you know, the team. Uh, just be a team player. Mm -hmm. uh, and then hopefully when you send your application, you'll have a good dean's letter, you'll have uh, probably a referral from one of the places where you want to get in, mm -hmm. hopefully a good one. Mm -hmm. And then if you could do maybe uh, a research project Mm -hmm. in OBGYN or whatever facets mm -hmm. of it, uh, that would be good. I would also say that you should really go on the home page of APCO, which is the American Professor of Ghani OB. Mm -hmm. uh, it's online and there it's very well uh, um, run uh, type of association specifically dedicated for medical students mm -hmm. and for residents. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, that is the third year or fourth year, if you have an interest, you should really try to, to be sponsored or try to attend one of those meetings so that you get to, uh, to know mm -hmm. what is the best program, mm -hmm. where to go, how to go, mm -hmm. and then you know, uh, move through or navigate through the app code page. Okay, so are those like conferences or? They are yearly conferences, mm -hmm. uh, but they are a trigger for medical students interested in OBGYN. And uh, you mentioned things like getting a good dean's letter. How would you uh, get a good dean's letter? Is it just by interacting and building a relationship, or is it by doing other things? Well, it's a combination. The dean only summarizes mm -hmm. what your uh, preceptors have written mm -hmm. about you, okay. and so he or she gets the list of your uh, evaluation, mm -hmm. and he or she makes the final letter. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more uh, favorable uh, preceptors evaluation you get, the better it is. Okay, and, and that would be throughout your third and fourth years, or primarily your fourth year? It's primarily the third year. Okay. Because if you think of the cycle... Oh, you start applying. Right. Yeah. You have to mm -hmm. start applying probably by August, mm -hmm. September, so you're not quite yet in your, you know, develop your fourth year. Mm -hmm. So if you have an interest in, in OBGYN, then I think you should try to plan to do an AI either in July or August, mm. but obviously everybody else wants to do that. Yeah. So uh, you have to start early mm -hmm. and, um, and plan, okay. because by December it's already too late. Mm -hmm. So first, really keep your mind open, but once you're 100% sure about OB, GYN, then you should try to apply for orientations early on, build the relationships there, get a good uh, dean's letter by doing well in your third year, and maybe get some research papers in as well. That is correct. So I kind of wanted to move on to a little bit more of like the financial aspects and other aspects of it. So um, how well are OBGYNs compensated generally? I would say that again, you have to divide it by OBGYN, and uh, for the purpose of this, I will call them the general OBGYN, mm -hmm. and then the specialist. Um, maternal fetal medicine, oncology, and fertility. So let's think about the general OBGYN. It all depends what type of practice you want to establish. Obviously, the solo practice is probably the more lucrative, mm -hmm. but it's taxing mm -hmm. because whatever you do, you keep. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's a lot of work. The group practice, it all depends. Usually you join a well-established practice. So being the junior member, you cannot expect to be making as much as the senior member. Mm -hmm. So usually it's a gradation you know, and a progression. So most practices will give you a set salary. Mm -hmm. And then as you progress a few years back, you bring something to the practice, then you go on to kind of a split sharing type of thing. So that's one aspect. Another aspect that a lot of young people really, really enjoy doing is the Kaiser Permanente type of model. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you come in, it's very, um, very set in terms of what you do. Mm -hmm. They tell you how many patients you see per day. They mm -hmm. take care of the schedule. Mm -hmm. You come in early in the morning, you leave, and you have, everything is very well structured. They have a set amount of dollars, mm -hmm. which is very competitive with other specialties. Mm -hmm. And then the nice thing about the Kaiser model is the fact that you have an investment in the company and after 25 or 30 years you could retire mm -hmm. at almost 70 or 80 percent of your salary. Mm -hmm. So very attractive for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, the third model is to uh, continue with the group and decide to give up OB as you get more senior and stick to the guy. Mm -hmm. So in terms of salaries I really think it is very competitive with any specialties. Okay, and so it's generally very competitive, um, and models like Kaiser would give you a, a solid initial pay um, and retirement benefits, but solo practice would basically allow you more, um, more of kind of like the entrepreneurial side where it's like high risk, higher reward, and uh, you have potential to go up even more. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and so how would you recommend doctors, especially like, um, you, know, you know, there's many years of like undergrad and medical school, like student debt and like um, not really making a lot of money. So I feel like a lot of doctors coming out and finally having money um, or finally having their income like, you know, multiply several fold, they, they, they're not the best with money. How would you recommend physicians um, take care of their finances and uh, safely invest, for example, and just deal with their finan finances in a way where they can have financial independence? Well, again, I'm not a financier, mm -hmm. and I won't give you any advice on how to keep your money or what to do with your money. But what I would say is wherever you go, you have to think of the future, and you have to think of, of, of the past and the present. So let's talk about the past. The past is the debt. The mm -hmm. debt is significant. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're coming out. That's very important. You could have defrayed you know, payment. Mm -hmm. You could have monthly payment. Um, and then manage this. Uh, two, I would say that, you know, go into a group uh, that is already established so you don't have the initial expenses mm -hmm. of setting yourself up. Mm -hmm. um, so you, right away you earn an income mm -hmm. as opposed to being solo where mm -hmm. you have to wait three or four months to get this. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, advice, in terms of finance, think of your future. Uh, and that is to invest in 401k. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, as physician, unfortunately, there's nobody looking after us mm -hmm. but us. Yeah. So if you don't invest in 401k, and, mm -hmm. and that's tricky because you like to keep as much money as you can, but yet you see those dollars, and they go away, and you said, well, I could really enjoy them now. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I would really caution you for, about not doing this. Mm -hmm. but. Kaiser, for example, does have a nice 401k. Mm -hmm. Most practices will probably give you a 401k plan uh, as you get more into the group. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is very important. Other things that you could look at uh, to help you defray some of the cost of the medical school is if you were to sign on with a group, ask them whether or not there is a sign-on bonus. Mm -hmm. That sign-on bonus is not for you to go ahead and, and buy a car, a fancy car, but it will probably be to sort of say, hey, I'm going to defray some of the cost, and that could help you out. So, but I'm not a financier, and I, mm. I can't give you more than that. Well, that, that was some good advice, though. Uh, and so, would, would that be one of the downsides? I'm assuming if you're um, a solo practitioner, like going to private practice, you wouldn't be able to have a 401k, right? There's no one to match your your contributions. Okay, no, that's not quite. And again, I'm not I'm not a financial person, and I wouldn't want you to think about that I'm giving you any finance advice. But a 401k is some money that you, by tax law, mm -hmm. could defer mm -hmm. either pre-tax money. So mm -hmm. you could contribute your maximum, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. The match can be done by the group or at Kaiser buy something. So they'll give you three or four percent mm -hmm. or whatever. So 
So obviously, if you're solo, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. The good news about it. So that'd be another downside of being solo then? That is correct. Okay. To backtrack a little bit, uh, we kind of, you kind of mentioned um, you, you felt like you weren't a specific fit for certain things like family medicine. It didn't really suit your personality. What kind of personalities do you feel are drawn to uh, OBGYN and what kind of skills are found in people that do well in that field? I cannot talk as a general rule and, mm -hmm. and put you in a box. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I think the only suggestion that I could see is what makes you kick, click. You know, if, if if you enjoy being in the operating room, that's one aspect. Mm -hmm. If you enjoy, uh, for example, delivering your baby, your baby, mm -hmm. that's another thing. If you enjoy doing cesarean section, if you enjoy uh, the trauma or the drama, mm -hmm. uh, like I, I did with emergency medicine, then. Mm -hmm. High risk obstetrics is the way to do it. Um, if you love the compassion of having an infertile couple mm -hmm. and you give them the gift of having one or two babies, mm -hmm. that's a passion that, mm -hmm. that you have. So I can't put you in a box and say mm -hmm. this is a personality, but I think you just have to try it and see whether you this is what you love. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically try it out. And I think also you mentioned previously that it's one of the fields that allows you, if you're a person that likes to do surgery and likes continuity of care and all these different aspects, it allows you to do all of those things as well as like women's health and things like that. So maybe like people that are drawn to those as well would be absolutely um, a good fit. Would you uh, do the same career path again if you had the choice? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No question. I will do it again tomorrow. Okay, great. Because I know, I, like just like even reading online like about physicians, a lot of them say they choose a different specialty or not even do medicine again sometimes? Nope. Okay. I'll do it again. That's great. So what do you think was uh, important factors in allowing you to have, find a specialty that you really vibe with well? Well, again, as I mentioned, I didn't know that I was going to like OBGYN. Mm -hmm. To me, it was foreign. Mm -hmm. You know, woman, baby, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of blood. Oh, my yeah. God, you know, I'm slimy. I'm going to drop the baby. <laughs> I'm not good for that. And, uh, until I, I was there. Mm -hmm. Then something clicked, and yeah. I thought, "Wow, this is this is nice." I was in the operating room, and said, "Wow, this is good." Yeah. I was into the internal medicine aspect of maternal fetal, and I said, "Hmm, I like to treat the diabetes. Yeah, I like the thyroid problem. Oh, I like this. I like that. Yeah, this is a challenge that was appealing to my internal medicine that I originally liked, mm -hmm. which was connected to the family practitioner that was my, you yeah. know, uh, mentor, mm -hmm. and it all." kind of came around full circle. Mm. So it kind of goes back to your thing you are saying about how early in medical school you just like try everything and so try it and then just like really pursue it and um, that's how you land a job that year. The thing that I'm trying to say is find your passion. Mm. If you have a passion mm. then I think this is key because don't forget this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life mm. and if you don't like getting up in the morning to go to work, mm -hmm. not worth it. Definitely. How has medicine changed from when you started practicing to now? Uh, also, like how you see it changing in the future, and how you think we should kind of adapt to it. Like I know, like for example, telemedicine is coming out, becoming really strong. Uh, artificial intelligence, I'm sure, will start having more and more of a role. Diagnosis and all kinds of things in medicine. So. In terms of the changes, let's talk about the good changes. The good changes to me is information, mm -hmm. diffusion of information. I said, remember. Uh, having to go to the library and staying there until it closes mm -hmm. and then try to take the bus home or whatever. You guys have so much information mm -hmm. at your fingertip. I mean, this is fantastic. Uh, you guys know more than me when I give a lecture. Why? Because you search the whole <laughs> internet and you sort of say, you know, I don't think what you're saying is, is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think to me, to learn that information changes so fast, so frequently, mm. is a, a huge difference between when I study. Some of the books you see behind me, by the time they come out, they're already mm. done. Yeah. So information that comes out, the diffusion of information, communication of information is, is terrific. Mm -hmm. um, same thing, I have a patient who is much more knowledgeable today 
when she comes to my office and talks about X, Y, and Z. Why? Because she has searched it. Mm -hmm. And I love that because she knows mm -hmm. about the subject as opposed to me giving her the subject. She has done her homework and, and now she's challenging me. Mm -hmm. So it's great because now we have a nice discussion. Mm -hmm. So this is very positive. You talk about artificial artificial intelligence. Absolutely. You know, if, if you have a post-op patient who goes home, giving her instruction, I mean, she gets instruction from you, from the nurse, from the anesthesiologist, from, from everybody. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know what? I just came out of whatever drug you gave me. I don't remember a thing. So yeah, what it would be fantastic to have. Do you have a tablet? Do you have a phone? To have all those things. Mm -hmm. Why don't we use a tablet, the phone, as, as an intermediate mm -hmm. between the patient and me? Mm -hmm. Can we communicate? Can we have things? Can we put those orders right there? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so all this technology to me is terrific. Artificial intelligence also, uh, medication error. Mm -hmm. For example, if I write an order and I forget the decimal point, Mm -hmm. Yes, I like the artificial intelligence to say, mm -hmm. Dr. Ray, did you really mean 2 milligrams as opposed to 0.2 milligrams? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Error, for example, we talk about, you know, barcode. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're asleep, uh, I want to make sure that you're giving me the right medicine and it's not, the medicine is not for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So barcodes, mm -hmm. to check, recheck, re-recheck, you know, this is fantastic. We didn't have this in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, to have somebody in, 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 in high risk and re the computer recognizing, hey, you know, if I look at this pattern of fetal heart rate, you know, the outcome is such and this, mm -hmm. fantastic. So all of those things are terrific mm -hmm. and, and I embrace that and I hope that we have more. The thing that I don't like is the electronic medical records. Mm -hmm. I'm old fashioned paper, I like to touch, to feel, mm -hmm. to see. Medical records are, 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 are just, just honestly, uh, they're not easy, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 they're not easy because each hospital has a different EMR, mm -hmm. and unfortunately they don't talk to each other, mm -hmm. and unfortunately I think when we set this whole thing up, mm -hmm. uh, we have so many hybrids. Mm -hmm. that now we're duplicating things and reduplicating things. And for example, Kaiser, and I, I, I'm coming back to Kaiser, has a very robust system. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's throughout Kaiser. Yeah. So whether you are Kaiser East Coast, West Coast, up and down, sideways, it doesn't matter. You walk into a place, mm -hmm. you pop, that's it. Yeah. That's ideal. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go one system here and then you go to another system and you go to another system, you got to start all over again. I mean, so that's one aspect that I really do not like about, you know, the current, present medicine. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like an issue with like not having a standardization between like the EMR systems. Uh, how would you think we could solve that? Would there be some kind of like governmental like mandate of the system or? Well, I think some of the IT people, the bright IT people should really sort of uh, have some type of platform mm. that really basically one system talks to the other. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I'm not an IT person, mm -hmm. but I would think that, yeah. you know, those people sort of say, hey, you know, system A, you don't talk to system B, mm -hmm. but let me be able to interface with them. But then, you know, people worry about that. They sort of say, well, I don't want to give you my information and it's proprietary. Yeah. So there's a whole legal aspect of things mm -hmm. that come into play. Mm -hmm. So, but unfortunately, I think we have created that monster, mm -hmm. and I don't know how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there anything else kind of like in the future that you see coming up that's gonna change medicine even in the next few decades? I think one thing that is terrific is robotic surgery. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we are able to do fascinating things mm -hmm. from a console hall. Mm -hmm. You could operate anywhere. Yeah, the Da Vinci. The Da Vinci, yeah. and you can, you know, we we are away from the uh, from the table, but uh, coming up, for example, if you have an expert in whatever field, mm -hmm. and you have a patient who's in another country, mm -hmm. you could, through, you know, the uh, the robotic, actually have that one expert operate on some 
mm. some patience yeah. somewhere. This is just terrific. Mm. The other thing that is fantastic is simulation. We need more simulation. For example, um, emergencies happens everywhere, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, they happen so rarely mm -hmm. that even though you saw one, yeah. uh, it's not enough because mm -hmm. when it happens, you sort of say, "Ooh!" So again, retraining, robotics, you know, uh, drills, mm -hmm. communicating, seeing how we work as a team. I think communication through big hospital and institution is a big concern. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really very important to uh, to, to to work around that, mm -hmm. and I think we can do it because of the technology. Okay. We talk a little bit about how to take care of yourself financially. How do you recommend balancing like that work-life balance? How do you kind of achieve that? Well, again, I've got gray hair. You got black hair. <laughs> uh, I think there's a generation gap, and I think your generation is much smaller. Uh, than my generation, or at least I can't talk about my generation, but about me, where it was work, work, work. Mm -hmm. um, and my family did suffer some of it. Mm -hmm. I think your generation, if I could generalize, and again, I'm not trying to, but it's, it's basically saying, you know what, when I'm working, mm -hmm. I'm going to give 100%. Mm -hmm. But when I'm not working, mm -hmm. I'm also going to give. 100%. Mm. And I think the way things are set up, especially in OBGYN, you can do that. Mm. And I think that's the generational gap mm -hmm. where I think you are probably correct. Mm. In the old days, we would say, oh my God, he doesn't care, yeah. he, he's, he's slacking, mm. and all this thing. But at the end of the day, I think you probably, you, not you, but your generation probably has the right way of the right balance. Mm. When I'm working, I am going to yeah. work. But when I'm off, I'm going to be off. Is there any kind of um, books or uh, organization, any kind of resources you recommend? You mentioned that conference, is it AMCO? APCO. APCO. Um, any kind of other resources you recommend either uh, generally at, for future physicians or um, specifically for...